taxi cabs, taxis, cabs, they are governed by laws that apply to hackney carriages. Consequently, under the law, every cab in London is supposed to have enough, enough hay, enough straw to feed the horses. <laughs> you can check it out. The trouble, of course, is, well, the good thing about London, of course, is that no one goes and harasses people, harasses drivers of taxi cabs because of non-implementation of this particular law. That's not quite happened what happens in India, unfortunately. <laughs> so let me give you examples. In India, we have something called the Indian Sarai's Act. Indian Sarai's Act, I think it was 1867. What does the Indian Sarai's Act say? It says the Sarai's Act applied to the Sarai's, which were the roadside of resting places for travelers, let me call it that. And what the Indian Sarai's Act says is that every Sarai keeper must provide free drinking water to everyone who passes by. There was a five-star hotel in Delhi, which again I will not name, which was prosecuted under the Indian Sarai's Act. <laughs> because it was not given free drinking water and why it was it prosecuted? Because someone from the municipal corporation wanted a bribe which is to help to give. The second element I will mention is a question of unifying and rationalizing and harmonizing the law. All of you are lawyers and the best example that I can think of is in the area of labor law. Today under the labor law, I do not know who's a worker. I do not know who's an employee. I do not know who's a child. The case law is even more confusing. So I have situations where Fiki is described, Fiki as in the chamber, is described as a manufacturer. But the manufacturer of beeries is described as non-manufacturer. <laughs> so, this would be the second, unifying and harmonizing. The third area would be that of administrative law. And let me give you an anecdote from administrative law. The administrative law in India has not been still streamlined. And you can go and look this up, I'm not making it up. One of the reasons why it has not been streamlined is because no one knows what this country's administrative law is. Because the last time it was collated at the initiative partly, I think, of S.P. Sake was way back in 1963. So in 1988, in 1998, as Prime Minister, I.K. Gujral woke up and decided the administrative law of the country needed to be reformed. And this is what I'm not making up. So there was this committee set up to review India's administrative law. Those were the terms of reference. And this committee begins by saying that we were supposed to examine India's administrative law, but no one within the government has been able to give us a complete set of India's administrative law. So we cannot do what we were supposed to do. Instead, we are going to examine India's statutes. And therefore, this is what eventually became the Jain Commission, which led to the repeal of certain old laws when Arun Jaitley was the law. The administrative law, and I'm talking about labor laws, <coughs> under which 37 different inspectors, all independent inspectors, can descend on you and can demand a bribe. Let me give you one or two quick examples. For example, the Factories Act 1948. That's not the offensive part. The offensive part is the Factories Rules under the Factories Act of 1948. And what does the damn thing say? It says that you must have an earthen pot filled with water for drinking water. If you have a water cooler, you are technically violating the water. You must have red painted buckets filled with sand for fires. If you, are fire, if you have fire extinguishers, you are technically violating the law. Now all of these things are routinely used to harass people. The final element of law reform which is where I will end, is of course the speed of dispute resolution. There is a gypsy curse, which is supposed to be anonymous, and this gypsy curse says, may you have a lawsuit in which you are in the right. And gypsies, as you know, are supposed to have originated in India. If we have
have a system where we have upwards of 30 million cases stuck in the system, then obviously the legal system is not very clever. 30 million only within the court system. Because when you look at these figures, these figures are purely for the court system. There are several others that are stuck in quasi-judicial forums. On an average, you know, I should tell you this final story and then I will stop. I've told you the story about Narasimha Reddy, but let me now repeat it because it's a good story. Great story. Ah. In the introduction, it was said that I was involved in a law reforms project. When I became involved in this law reforms project, I asked all my lawyer friends, what is the longest case in India? I wanted to find out what is the longest case that has been resolved, not cases that are stuck in the system. I was tracking a, 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 a case in Calcutta for which the light last hearing had happened in 1915. I'm not talking about that, but cases which had been resolved. So none of my lawyer friends knew the answer. Then I looked up the Guinness Book of World Records. <laughs> the Guinness Book of World Records said, that India had the dubious distinction of the longest standing case in India, which began in 1205 and ended in 1966. <laughs> I found this a remarkable figure, 761 years. Yes, I 